it's noon here, so it's time to get started with my talk about the uni. Let me share my screen. Okay. You shall now see it. Can everybody see my screen? I will assume a yes. yes. Okay. Then. So, uh, welcome to the second day of the OpenSUSE conference and LibreOffice conference, and let's get to it. My name is Power Thea. I am the product owner and technical project manager of SUSE Manager Work of SUSE. I used to be a Debian developer, a KD developer, and you know, I have a long story in open source since probably more than 15 years ago. I'm available, usually can be found in in Freenode or Gitter, and of course, by email. I'm going to talk about the uni, because being the, the product owner of SUSE Matter makes me, in a way, the benevolent dictator of uni since Uyuni is the upstream for SUSE Manager. So what is Uyuni? It's a systems management solution. Okay, when you have tens, hundreds, of thousands of servers, you cannot just hack your own scripts or log into each of the servers, but you want to have some kind of automation, something, and even dashboards, something that makes you feel that, and, and gives you proper information about the status of everything. We can manage all kinds of workloads for a single place. So it's single systems, uh, different Linux operating systems, uh, even clusters or, or other products like uh, Kubernetes clusters can also be managed uh, to a degree from SUSE manage, uh, from Uyuni, sorry. <laughs> um, we have uh, a reporting and auditing capabilities, both from the web UI, our web UI and command line tools. And of course, there's an API. We can do software and hardware inventories, which is very useful for compliance or even just to know what, what is going on in your organization. Uh, Uyuni can do configuration management. It's something that you will do, for instance, if you use an empty virus and you want to deploy the, the virus signatures to all your servers, then you can use uh, a, a configuration file. It's typically it's a JSON file, or XML file with definitions that you can deploy to all your servers using our configuration management capabilities. Uyuni also has some KVM and, and Zen based virtualization features. It's not nearly uh, as powerful as VMware or anything like that or Nutanix. But if you only need some limited virtualization, like for tens of virtual machines, this can be an option for you. This is the, the architecture of Uni. It's a typical client server application where we have introduced this uh, element in the middle in case you need to offload your server. So if you have tens or even hundreds of clients, you can attach them directly to the server. If you are in the thousands or tens of thousands of clients, then you, or if, if you are on, on locations, on sites where you have bad connectivity from the client to the server, this proxy element can help you offload because it caches that. It acts, it acts as a case, as a cache. Yeah. It, it doesn't really do uh, a lot of management by itself. The, the intelligence in you know, uh, lives in the server. But uh, the proxy is very useful in many cases. Uh, the origin of Uyuni is a, a project by Red Hat called Spacewalk. It's, it's what they used originally to create their Red Hat network, their customer portal, essentially. Uh, then they released it as open source and made it available for customers to install on-premise or for the open source community to install on-premise. Then SUSE took it. Uh, 10 years ago, and from there we started adding features to to uh, more focused on on SUSE systems and also modernizing it. Uh, Spacewalk is a very old project. It started around 2008, probably a bit earlier if we count for the version previous to to what was released. But let's say it has 12 years. It was the base for Red Hat Satellite 5, 
Now, Red Hat Satellite is at version 6, which is based on something completely different called Catello. Uh, we didn't believe in that path in SUSE, so we continued the spacewalk uh, in the form of a union. We'll explain why. And SUSE Manager pre, uh, version 3.2 and earlier was also based on the original spacewalk project. Spacewalk is already dead, died almost six months ago, and Red Hat uh, officially regarded Uni as the continuation of the spacewalk. Now, why did we fork uh, spacewalk? Because uh, Red Hat didn't really believe in, in spacewalk anymore. At some point, they started contributing code or started a new project called Catello. You, have, you may have heard of it for MumPulp. It's uh, several components dependent, it's, it's a different model. But the space work worked for us. Red Hat did not hand us the project, so we forked it in the form of Uni, and we uh, made official the, the, some of the features. So one of the most important features that Uni has versus Spacewalk is the two stacks. Uh, that there's the original Spacewalk stack, what we call the traditional client, and there's also the salt stack is all the open source project. And then you can see the, the, the game with the, the words play the video. So it's salt, then Uyuni is the largest, salt flat, yeah, bad joke. Um, although we support the traditional client, still, because it allows uh, customers or users to migrate from a space or satellite five to Uni and to the manager without converting to salt, and that's a transition path that many of them use. All the new development goes into salt clients, into what we call the, the minions, or in some cases also the, the salt SSH clients. Most of the functionality is also supported agentless. So while I say two stacks, it's actually three ways of managing your clients. So you have the traditional client, which is uh, which requires an agent. There's also a salt minion, which also is an agent, and there's salt SSH, which is kind of like Ansible, agentless. Not all the features are available with salt SSH because of some constraints of the features that require continuous reporting to the server, but many of them are. So if you are looking for agentless, this is also a solution for you. Uh, another of the features that we added in Uni is containers and Kubernetes integration. You can create and scan and uh, security audit containers from Uyuni. We also extended capabilities, scalability a lot. So in the past, uh, Spacewalk was regarded as a solution for thousands of clients. So let's say single digit thousands, no more than two or 3,000 clients. Like, for instance, Catello. It doesn't scale beyond a few low digit thousand clients. Now with the spacewalk, with a single server, we have done up to almost, or let's say more than 30,000 clients. It's actually beyond that, but 35,000 clients, we know it can be done because we have some cases of that, which simplifies maintenance and, and, yeah, and management. We have also spent a lot of effort in usability because some things are not so easy when you when you have a ton of features like we have, and uh, there are many cases. I'm I'm always surprised at how how differently different users can uh, use uh, Uni. It's surprising. So some people have their own situations because firewalls, the network, network policies, or company policies, and they find their own way. And then they come to us and say, hmm, really interesting. And then we enhance the uni to make that uh, easier for them and for everybody. We have modernized the web UI, which is based on JSP and an old framework called Struts. With, and we have added uh, a React web UI. So the new pages are written in React and some of the older ones are also being replaced slowly. We have modernized the code base and it now uses exclusively Python 3 and Java 11. And this is the upstream for SUSE Manager of, since version 4.0. Actually, uh, SUSE Manager 4.0 was released only last year, so a year ago, but in June 2018, after the release of, of SUSE Manager 3.2, we uh, no longer 
used Spacewalk as the reference for Suzy Manager, but Uyuni. So what can you do with Uyuni? Uh, you can, of course, do system deployments. You can do patch management. You can do service pack migration, like migrating from SLS 15 SP1 to SP2. You can do configuration management. You can do bare metal provisioning, or of course, virtual machine provisioning. You can schedule action changes to be performed on the system. That means you have several actions that you want to be uh, done to be performed one after the other, including reboots. Then you can do that. You can use it for compliance, the CVE audit and open scap capabilities. So you can get your, you can see your dashboard with all this information and fix the vulnerabilities in just one click. And there's of course an API that uh, typically the, the users with large deployments in the thousands prefer to use the API and Git rather than using the web UI because it can become um, sometimes more confusing when you have that many systems. We have added some features because all of these are available in Spacewalk or most of these, but then we have added in Uni more things like the transparent integration with Salt. This is something that makes Uni a lot more powerful than Spacewalk was because with Salt you, you get a lot of possibilities for automation that you didn't have with Spacewalk. You can use it to manage on-premise cloud or hybrid cloud and multi-cloud systems. So we have these cases and there are even videos in, in that you can find on YouTube, some of them by Suze, so, uh, for Suze Manager, but essentially anything that you see for Suze Manager works also with Uyuni, where people are using uh, Uyuni to manage uh, CentOS and RHEL and SLES and Ubuntu and Oracle Linux. Some of them are running on-premise, others are running on Azure, others are running on AWS, and it's just working from the same console and with the same reporting and everything. So one single dashboard, one single management place, all your systems. We have this cool feature that we introduced last year, which is content lifecycle management, uh, which is very aligned with the DevOps uh, way of working, where you define stages, development, test, production, for your software channels and you are promoting the, the packages, uh, testing, and then deploying uh, gradually to your systems. You can create groups of systems, so a test, a test group, deploy there, or a canary group, then when you are even going to production, and instead of having surprises, then this just works, and it's a very visual way. In the past, you could do this in a not so easy way from command line applying scripts and yeah but this is so much better than when you when you try this you you never want to go back to anything uh, regarding scripts we have recurring actions you can execute um, several times you can build always images and container images from the packages that um, the uni server has mirrored for several operating systems as i said also compliance also even for subscription matching in the case of SUSE systems and products so that you you know that you are you have enough subscriptions and no more subscriptions than you need it will even optimize the number of subscriptions you need it can also do some virtualization and it can uh, do monitoring we have included the Prometheus and grafana stack including federation and reverse proxy, which are some very cool features because they allow you to aggregate from different sites, from different even uh, products because you could use the Uyuni server and the Uni dashboards as the, uh, let's say the authoritative uh, site, the authoritative dashboard, even if you're using additional stuff like a Kubernetes cluster or some other yeah, monitoring on the cloud, that is not even managed by Uyuni, you can bring that to the Uni dashboards. And we have this cool feature called the formulas with forms, which is essentially salt formulas with a visual aid. It's just a YAML uh, template with a few placeholders that you can fill. And uh, this doesn't even require programming skills to create them, 
but I'll uh, make using salt stuff a lot easier and a lot more convenient. So where are we with the uni? We have uh, done a lot since we open sourced it two years ago. So the repository is public, the development uh, happens in the public. Everything SUSE does first happens in a uni before SUSE manager. So uni is always slightly ahead of SUSE manager. We are available. Uh, there's mailing list. There's, I, well, actually the, the RSC channel is deprecated. We, are, we now prefer Gitter because it's easier for people to join this web uh, IRC, let's say. Web chat. We have a, a CI with uh, Jenkins. It's not completely public, so you can see the uh, output or you can see what happens. But then, uh, if you need to go into details, that part uh, we have not managed to make it public because it runs on, on SUSE servers internally. The base operating system for Uni these days, since three months ago, is OpenSUSE Leap 15.2. Um, that upgrade happened in in the unit 2020 so so we uh, after we open a new version of OpenSUSE leap is released we always move to it for the server you can of course still manage OpenSUSE leap 51 systems and 15 clients what are the client operating systems supported by uni a ton of them that's that's one of the differentiators of uni can we of course support any uh, supported version of SLE, OpenSUSE, Red Hat, the Press Linux, CentOS, well, the, the myriad of clones that there are, RHEL, CentOS, Oracle Linux, uh, select expanded support. There's reports of Fedora being used, although some features in Fedora may break uh, if you are not using our salt packages, but the, the packages provided by EPEL, so um, you need to, to be aware of this in case you want to try Fedora. This was a, this is a community contribution. It's not actually still yet part of, of Uni. And there's uh, some limited support for Amazon Linux too. Um, we will probably enhance this in the not so distant future. And there's, of course, support for non-RPM based operating systems like Ubuntu, Debian, and something very weird called Astra Linux, which is a Russian uh, version of, of Debian. So what has happened? So we are almost at the end of the year. What did we do in, the, in 2020 in Uni? We went from two releases a year to one a month, essentially. So the only months we skipped were January, or actually February, because we released on the last day of January. So yeah. it didn't really make a lot of sense to release in February. We didn't have that much to, to release. And then August, because yeah, we needed summer vacation. The next release will happen in around two weeks from now. So at the end of, um, of October, we typically release at the end of the month. There are virtual machine and, uh, and cloud images available for a lot of, of uh, kinds. So AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, KVM, Zen, Hyper-V, and OpenStack. They are not yet available in the marketplaces. We don't know when we will do this because it involves creating accounts on, on, the, on the marketplaces, on, on the clouds. So this uh, has some implications that we have not been able to, to deal with so far. We have a Kita channel, which is the, the fastest way and the, the the best way to contact us for, say, immediate or real-time information. There's also, of course, the mailing list. And we have the unique community hours. This is something that we started around May. And uh, every month, at the last Friday of the month, 4 p.m. European time, we present what's new in the, in the new release of Uni. The next Uni community hours are happening on the 30th of October, 4 p.m. European time. Look, uh, uh, check the mailing list, the Uni mailing list, and you will find the invitations. And this year, we also participated in Google Summer of Code. We had a very good result with a student who contributed 
to the uh, documentation theme and the, and the multiple language support. Oops, I just disclosed something. Translations. More features that we have added in this year, the hub. So I said that with a single server, you can do more than 30,000 clients, but what if you want to go to hundreds of thousands of clients or even a million clients? Can you do that? Yes. Since this summer, we have something called the, the, the Uni Hub, which allows you to orchestrate several Uni servers. This is not yet complete, but the, there's uh, two parts of it. There's, or even you could say two and a, and a bit more. There's the, the XML uh, RPC API, which allows you to uh, manage lots of, of servers and lots of, of clients from the API, which is typically, as I said earlier, it's the, the case that you are going to, to want, because if you have 200,000 clients, imagine that from the web UI, well, good luck with that. It will be confusing. You, you probably want to use the API, and that's why we implemented the API first. And then we have also salt states that allow you to keep all the users and groups and organizations uh, in sync across the different servers all managed from the hub. And we are uh, implementing more. So the next, the, the other thing that we implemented was is something called activation keys, which is essentially a token that allows you to bundle several, let's say, subscribe uh, servers to the same channels, to the same uh, configuration files, to the same things. It makes it easier to keep different servers in sync. We also added maintenance windows, which is essentially a must if you are in any uh, enterprise environment. You cannot just do actions whenever you want, and you, you don't want to allow for accidents to happen. So with maintenance windows, when someone schedules, uh, I don't know, um, an upgrade or patching servers from or, or even building images, at a certain time, a certain point in time, if that point in time is not within the, the authorized maintenance windows by the organization, then those actions will be rejected. And you will be told, hey, you cannot do this outside of a maintenance window. We have the recurring high state, which means so the high state, for those of you unfamiliar with SALT, is essentially the, the whole state of the system all the packages and the configuration files and everything and the network configuration uh, of your system. So um, a very interesting feature is when you want to make sure that your system stay compliant so that no one is, goes to, to a server, Some someone may have access to a server individually and they want to install some software. And then your, that system is non-compliant. With the recurring high state, you can make sure that your systems all stay in the in the compliant state. So in, in what the, your organization mandates. And there's nothing outside of it. And it, if, there's some, if there needs to be something that's different for one or more servers, then you want to make that a different state. And you want to be aware of that. So this is very useful for compliance or for patch automation or for it has lots of different uses the recurring high state we also introduced a new installer framework if you have ever tried to uh, install systems in an automated way with auto yast or with kickstart you will know that it's not exactly easy to write these uh, profiles these auto station profiles yomi salt based so you just need to write a few YAML files. It's very simple. And in the uni, we have the formulas that provide a UI for this. So you just need to, you have this wizard where you can configure how you want to partition your disk, what kind of software you want to install, uh, yeah, what systems you want, how you, are you going to boot those systems, and Yomi and Uni will take care of everything. It will run Cobbler behind the scenes, and uh, network with your computers. We also introduced storage pools for the virtualization features. So now we have some machines, not only with file-based storage, but also with these storage pools and yeah, ISCSI, Ceph, and all of these uh, possibilities. 
There's also EF, EFI HTTP boot, so not only Pixie boot. This is useful, for instance, where you have a wireless boot, or what are machines connected by a wireless. There's also, by the way, a USB boot is also possible. There's single sign-on from the web UI. This is useful if you have, for instance, Active Directory or Azure Active Directory, and you want to connect your SUSE your, sorry, I keep saying SUSE match because I do lots of presentations, um, your UUNI uh, web UI to the to your Azure Active Directory. And we introduced new formulas. We have now like probably around 20, 25 formulas to configure an open VPN server, to configure the CPU mitigations. If you are scared of these uh, Intel's uh, CPU problems, Spectre and everything, we can deploy Prometheus and Grafana and even uh, Yomi is also formulas. There's a ton of different formulas. I will talk about that more because we are going to use more formulas in the future. And uh, in case you are using rail systems, on the cloud, purely on cloud, you don't have a Red Hat CDN account, then you can also manage those systems uh, using a, a custom header that you can add to a reposing, which is the tool that mirrors the packages. We also introduced monitoring. This The Prometheus service discovery is something that we have introduced in, in Prometheus. You're looking forward to submitting this upstream that now that they have lifted the uh, yeah, there was a, a, a small period where they were not accepting any more uh, service discovery features. Now that's allowed, we are going to submit it upstream so that when you have different, when all your managed systems, we can auto discover them and deploy monitoring and then uh, show them in the in the dashboards, in the Grafana dashboards. We also have federation, which means when you have different sites, each one of them with its own Prometheus server because you have weak links with weak network links across the sites and you don't want to uh, flood them with network traffic, with monitoring traffic. You aggregate the traffic in, in different Prometheus servers and federate all of that in a top Prometheus server. That can also be configured by a formula, by the way. You don't need to, it's really easy, it's just fill in some values, essentially the, the URLs of the servers, and that's it. We also have this reverse proxy for Prometheus, which simplifies the setup. So typically the way Prometheus works is you uh, have exporters installed on the client machines, and for it, each of, of the exporters, it requires its own TCP port. Now, that, if you if you are in an enterprise environment, is not exactly uh, easy to to deal with for security departments because they don't want you to install three um, Prometheus exporters, each of them opening a port. So the, this reverse proxy, the Prometheus exporter exporter, as it's called, will put all of those exporters in a single port so that uh, for the security authorization, it's much, much easier. And also for even if you want to secure your systems yourself, it's also easier. You just need to care about one port. Um, we offer uh, Grafana dashboards for Uni itself and for CAS, which is SUSE's uh, Kubernetes distribution. There's also some integrated self-monitoring. There's a little dashboard in the web UI itself, so not as a separate Grafana dashboard. And this is something that may look stupid, but happened a lot. Um, the way your uni works is if you want to manage CentOS 7 and CentOS 8 and SLS uh, 15, SP1 and Ubuntu, you need to mirror all those products, the whole thing. That requires hundreds of gigabytes of disks. Sometimes people do not notice and they exhaust the hard disk, especially the database hard disk, the file system where the, the database resides. And then the, the database becomes corrupted or the packages become uh, incomplete and yeah, all of hell breaks loose. Now we implemented a warning and uh, we stop the, the UUNI and stop mirroring packages and 
do not feel more this anymore when there is um, less than 5% of the disk available to make sure that your system is not destroyed unintendedly. We have added CASP for as, as a client. We can manage the whole cluster, in fact. Debian was also added, this came as a community contribution, and Relate was added also in 2020, including content lifecycle management, which support the app streams, which is something that if you have dealt with app streams, you will know it's not uh, exactly easy sometimes. So sometimes you have conflicts between app streams or packages in different app streams, we will warn you. Or if you try to apply a, a filter that conflicts with something else, we will warn you and we will not allow you to create an invalid repository. And I can tell you that this is something that people like. And when we say rel8, it includes all the clones. So it's rel8, uh, genuine rel, rel, then the CentOS, expanded support aid, Oracle Linux, and there's something called the Springdale Linux, which is uh, another rel clone by uh, Princeton University. It should also work because it's essentially just another clone. It's regarded as a REL system. You can use the same client tools that you use for CentOS, Transport, Oracle Linux. All is, it's the same because it's binary compatible. And we can also do subscription matching public clouds and even list systems running public clouds. This was also added this year with our virtual host gatherers. We worked a lot in usability previously until mid 2020 reposing so synchronizing the packages was really slow now it's like 10 times faster uh, building projects really huge projects was also very very slow um, we optimized that part a lot so what usually what, what used to take more than 20 hours now now takes half an hour you can see the kind of optimizations we made there this also something really uh, useful was previously when you upgraded your universe, you needed to do a two-step migration, a two-step upgrade, essentially. One was updating the software itself, so the, the RPM packages. The other was upgrading the, the database. This led to lots of problems because sometimes people forgot to upgrade the database. Sometimes they um, pushed it back. So they wanted the new software, but could not uh, wait the, the several hours that sometimes in some extreme cases, the database migration may take. And yeah, then they had broken functionality. Now it's all in one step. You upgrade the software, you upgrade the database. So you need to schedule your maintenance window for this, and that's it. We also generate uh, automatically the bootstrap repositories. So what's a bootstrap repository? So that's the minimal repository. When, when you want to manage a system with Uyuni, you need to install some software, or rather to transfer some software to the client to be managed. But since the system is not managed yet, how do you connect the dots? How do you connect the, the server with the uh, client? It's not possible, it doesn't have access to the, the repositories. That's what a bootstrap repository is. It's a minimal repository which contains the minimum set of packages that we need to transfer to a client to be able to manage it for the first time. And then from there, we can go. Once it's registered, we can go on and the bootstrap repository is never used. The bootstrap repositories were created manually for years, which again led to problems because people forgot to uh, upgrade, to regenerate them, or even to create them for the first uh, time. Now, when we sync the, the channels, when we mirror the packages, we automatically generate or update the bootstrap repositories, and that problem is now gone. Another very useful uh, feature is bootstrapping clients with SSH, uh, with, with SSH keys, actually. So in the past, it was only possible with uh, a login and the password, but if you're on the cloud, Typically, those machines do not come with a login and a password. They are only accessible by a SSH key. Now we support that. Service pack migration, something that really was a source of problems again. 
was people were um, uh, trying the, the service pack migration and then after uh, carefully I'm going to turn my camera on because I just realized it was off for some reason it turns off when you do screen sharing ah shit okay makes sense now. so have I now stopped sharing my screen I don't know it seems like the slides are still up okay then okay surprising yeah this is more useful Okay, then. Yeah, so what happened is people tried the service pack migration, uh, configured all the packages that they wanted to be uninstalled, installed, configuration files to be deployed, um, everything. It worked, and then they needed to redo everything from scratch. Yeah, And then they forgot some step. Always happened. So they reported, hey, this doesn't work. It used to work, but it breaks, and I have touched nothing. That, that's a, the magic sentence. I have touched nothing. I did nothing. Yeah, right. So now when uh, when the service file migration succeeds, you can go to the history and say, repeat this. And it will do exactly repeating the, the successful dry run. This is also, we have <laughs> got a, uh, saved a, a lot of people from mistakes with this. We are also enhanced the support for Debian and Ubuntu. Um, the, when we first introduced support for Ubuntu, it didn't support fine metadata or all the headers some of them were missing. Now we have full support for this. And we also introduced a single page application with UI based on React so that the, the UI is now more responsive than, than the, the JSP pages. We have done a lot of work in regards to documentation. There's now a large, large deployments guide. There's a public cloud kickstart guide, like a five-page guide that you uh, that tells you from start to beginning how. So essentially, from installation to managing your first client and creating your first content lifecycle management project. And there have been huge improvements to all the guides in general. So the administration guide, the client configuration guide, is now a lot, a lot, a lot better than it used to be. The reference guide is also improved. There are uh, improvements all across the documentation. We have almost 800 pages of documentation as of now. And we have, uh, there's, uh, in the formulas, there's this kitchen sink formula. This, this uh, formula doesn't really do anything, but it shows all the functionality, all the possibilities of the formula with full framework. And it's a good start if you want to write your own formula. So what are we going to do next? Where are we uh, heading in, in the coming months? Translations. The, I gave a talk about uh, translations yesterday uh, with Uni. We are essentially using Weblate provided by OpenSUSE, since we are associated with OpenSUSE anyway. And they will be introduced in the coming, yeah. And I don't know if it will be in the next release, so at the end of this month, or maybe in, in the release next month, but they expect that Japanese should be the first translation that we ship. The, this actually is Japanese was committee contributed by one of, of our committee members. In, in just six weeks, around six weeks, he translated the whole uh, Uyuni, which is more than 100,000 words to Japanese. That's impressive, I have to say. We will add support for something which is a SUSE specific, which is retracted patches. Let, let me start with what retracted patches are not. It will not uninstall anything that you have installed on your systems, okay? Retracted patches is when a SUSE product has released a patch which has side effects, bad side effects. Yeah, the, there's a, it, some metadata that SUSE can add to the ex, to the meta to the channel metadata, saying retract this patch. So do not install it anymore. But it will not uninstall it. So please keep this in mind because at uh, uh, the uni committee hours uh, six weeks ago, we had this problem that some people did not really uh, understand that. <laughs> I was caught by surprise because I didn't uh, think this this could be misinterpreted. But that's why I insist on this. 
we are going to add SAP content. So Prometheus exporters from SAP, Grafana dashboards for SAP, Kickstart, the Quick Scout Guide for SAP. So uh, this will make uh, managing as, as less for SAP much easier with the uni. And we have also introduced themes in the web UI. It all started with the uni theme, then uh, we, we have a dark theme, a light theme, and probably more themes. You can create your own themes. It's just a matter of forking uh, and, and editing a few CSS files and providing colors, maybe some pictures if you want. It's re really easy to create your own theme. If you're interested, get in touch through the mailing list or Gitter chat, and we can help you. We will also document this, by the way. It's not documented yet because it's not introduced. Actually, I think it was merged yesterday, but yeah, it's not released. Redfish is a new, if you know IPMI, or if you have used IPMI, you know that it works to boot machines and can do a lot of things, but it's not exactly the most convenient thing to do. Redfish is the new generation of IPMI, uh, essentially HTTP, I, uh, you can think of it as HTTP-based IPMI. It's now also implemented and merged. It will be released soon, probably in, in the in 2020.10 even. And uh, we want also to uh, include Debian and Ubuntu RATA information. That's something that is missing currently. Now, Debian and Ubuntu do not really have the concept of errata as uh, Red Hat or uh, SUSE operating systems have. But from the information, from the updates to Debian and Ubuntu, and in the same release, we can uh, fake that and provide that information. In the end, it's just saying you have this patch or this update to existing packages for your own release and they fix this CVE or this bug or this security problem. And we will keep enhancing the hub. As I said, we are going to, to provide also the next thing we are going to work is the inter-server thing. So currently, when you have several uh, Uyuni servers all managed by the Uyuni hub, you will download the, the packages, the RPM packages in each of the servers. We want to avoid that to save your traffic. Uh, and then the inter-server thing will take care of that, of synchronizing the packages and also the configuration files and everything so that you can uh, do, do that only so mirror once or, or have the files once on the hub and then they propagate to all the other servers. We are uh, working more on virtualization and this is from the from the SUSE side, of course. There's some more community contributions, and I will mention one at the at the end. Maintenance windows. One currently they work with uh, iCal files that you can generate with Outlook or ServiceNow or any other calendaring tool, uh, K Organizer, for instance, or Evolution. Uh, but you don't really see them. There's not a calendar view in Uyuni. We want to add that because that makes it a lot easier to, you know, it's, when you see it visually, it helps you. Cluster management, currently we can manage CASP clusters. We want to add more cluster types. So it could be just standard Kubernetes distribution, so non-SUSE, or different kinds of clusters. There are several ideas for this because Cluster doesn't really mean that it needs to be a cluster. A cluster for you may be all my Apache servers or a group of, of uh, if I am, I don't know, a WordPress uh, hosting service. For me, a cluster can be a database server plus two Apaches plus uh, two uh, storage servers. I can make my own cluster out of that. I can call that a cluster, a WordPress cluster. So writing clusters for cluster, writing cluster management uh, uh, plugins is relatively easy. And yeah, we want to add more and of course expect the community co to contribute with different cluster types. We want to keep making Uni easier to use. We have some ideas in regards to usability, for instance, the system list page or the, the products page are something that yeah can be improved. And of course, we continue building the community. So if, if you were part of the Uni community a year ago, you know, it was relatively small. Now it has grown. You can see there's a lot of activity in, the, in Gitter. 
the users helping each other. So there's of course people from SUSE there, but it's I'm very happy when I see one user helping another user and we are just listening there or in the community hours when, when people start proposing things and presenting their own stuff like Ansible uh, playbooks that were presented to uh, install Uyuni. Now, say you want to contribute to Uni because you are excited about this, as I, as I am. There's lots of ways, different ways of contributing. You can, of course, contribute with ideas and feedback. So we are available through the mailing list, Gitter and GitHub issues. You can contribute with code if you want to set up your development environment. This wiki page explains how to do that step by step, even configuring your IDE. And just hack and submit a pull, a pull request. If in doubt, just contact us first and we will help you. And another way of contributing is with translations. So in this case, you don't even need to, to write any code or clone a Git repository or anything. Just go to this WebLate project, Uyuni, and you will find the components. This wiki page explains all everything you will find there. And if you don't want to set up, if you want to, to see the output of what we are writing and you don't want to set up your tool chain in your local system, we provide a virtual machine for the recommendation tool chain, which is a bit more complex to set up. There are tons of opportunities for the community. So here are some ideas. I'm sure that you will have more. Of course, there's translations. This is an easy one because it requires no coding skills or uh, these articles or videos with uh, learning pills about the uni. Oops. There's, yeah, uh, creating formulas with forms for salt formulas, which are, there's a ton of formulas available from GitHub just a matter of adding a form or these uh, Debian and Ubuntu errata information as I said there there's already two uh, community efforts to this um, I have not tried any of them yet and I know that some people report it works some people report it doesn't um, it's it will be good if someone could take this and say okay this is what's missing, or this is how to use it and document it. Auto installation, this is uh, something that we are totally missing for Debian based operating systems. So even though uh, we only support kickstart, the, the kind of kickstart that Ubuntu supports is not the same. It requires different paths. So this could be a, an easy start. And ideally, we should support Preseed, which is the official Debian auto installation way and the Ubuntu auto installation way. There's uh, completing the, the Amazon Linux to support requires dealing with the metadata because Amazon Linux 2 uses SQLite metadata versus the XML metadata that every other RPM operating system supports or writing virtual host gatherers for your favorite cloud or, or, virtualization or hypervisor essentially. A virtual host gatherer is a plugin which is really small like uh, less than 200 lines of code really that uh, connects to a hypervisor or a hyperscaler and lists all the systems that are available there and brings them to SUSE manager. There's some more crazy ideas like uh, VDIs with doing VDI with, uh, with Uni, even with our limited uh, virtualization support, this is completely possible if you think about it. I have uh, something written that I will probably publish in the wiki soon. More advanced stuff, containers, matching Helm charts, integrating um, containers plus packages in containerless cycle management because sometimes some products require that, that you install packages and then you install containers combined or using Harbor, this is a typo here. Harbor for staging the containers. We don't really need to implement container staging in uh, in Uyuni. Enhancing virtualization, like network configuration or snapshots. Pixie boot is in the works, but there's a lot of more advanced configuration like CPU, pinning, lots of stuff. Windows, Mac, Android, more clients, yes. Or an integrated editor, maybe based on Eclipse Thea or Microsoft Monaco. 
which is uh, the same thing that is used for Visual Studio Code. Or uh, if you want to create your own dashboard, integrate it in Uyuni, then having a web framework to that will be also useful because with the Grafana you can do that, but it's yeah, doesn't feel as integrated as it could be. We are part of we are participating in, in Hector Fest this year. So you can continue with code or documentation or translations and get a t-shirt. You can use one of the ideas that I just explained, or if you have more ideas, you're free to do so. I will recommend to get in touch first to make sure that uh, yeah, you're on the right path. Here you can see that we have several uh, GitHub issues uh, labeled, with, labeled with Hacktoberfest. And this is the Hacktoberfest initiative page where you can um, find more information about Hacktoberfest. Questions? I'm going to start with an answer, by the way, because this is asked a lot. Uh, is Uyuni available for CentOS or RHEL or Oracle Linux or Debian? No. It's not yet, but uh, there's a community effort in that direction. There are two guys working on making Uyuni available on CentOS. Um, that effort is rather advanced. I don't know when it will come and we will, of course, accept it. One day, man. One day. <laughs> And the, the other question that I get asked a lot is if we can manage Windows clients. Not yet. It's my pet project. It's not that difficult uh, if you're using the salt stack to manage the clients. I can even mirror the, the updates from Microsoft that they can deploy them to the clients. But um, I'm, yeah, so it kind of works, but it doesn't because it's not visible on the web UI. It works from the command line, but not from the web UI. If you're interested, get in touch and we will yeah, <laughs> make more advancements here. And that's essentially it. So now it's a time for your questions <laughs> instead of my answers. Yeah. Oh, so that's why it was A and Q. I was about to wonder. I was wondering. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so a couple of uh, questions for me, at least. Uh, the first is, uh what why why are you going to do this retracted patches stuff because the, the problem with retracted patches is not that oh it doesn't affect existing installed systems it makes it makes configuration management and installation and mirroring completely uh non-deterministic because if SUSE pushes a thing that says hey this patch shouldn't be synced or downloaded or installed anymore that essentially breaks the consistency that most people use a uni for. That's no. the reason why the community was like, this makes no sense to actually have. No, 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 no. You, you can still explicitly install it. Yeah, but it won't happen automatically when some machines have it and others don't. That's a problem. No, no, no. That, that not, will not happen. So once, your, uh, once the patch is in, it doesn't get removed from your content cycle management project. It just happens that if if a patch is released today and you only create this content lifecycle management project in two weeks, because your maintenance window is once a month, which is a typical maintenance window, then you will see that by default the retracted patches are, and it's not even that you you, you need to add this filter. So the way we are uh, implementing this is you need to add a, a filter saying, do not uh, add retracted patches. Okay, so it's nothing undeterministic or nothing and uh, nothing unexpected will happen. The only thing that will happen is that if you don't want retracted patches, you will have this possibility. Okay, so it's not active by default and nobody no, has to no, actually no. use it. Okay. No, no, no. So it's 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 uh it's going to work in the way that you want. Of course, if you still want to uh install a retracted patch because the side effect, the bad side effect why it was retracted. Um doesn't affect you or you can live with it you can still do that but then don't cry if <laughs> it destroys your systems well look I, i'd rather have five destroyed systems that died the same way that rather than two destroyed systems that died one way and yeah. <laughs> three that died a different way that that's worse so 
that that's that was my objection to it at least the last community meeting mm. um yeah. the other question i have is uh with the uh with the new theming stuff uh does this mean that we can do things like have fixed terminology for some of the uh, more idiosyncratic uh phrasing that's used in uni that we inherit from suma like using patches for referring to updates uh and and actually going back to using the word updates uh because uh it's really confusing and and doesn't make sense to call patches update uh, call updates patches yeah so themes uh yeah so that's a whole different discussion i'm not going to enter it. that that's a discussion for uh the let's say the zipper people or the I mean, I'm talking about <laughs> yeah, yeah, but no, but themes are visual themes, so like colors, pictures, uh, fonts, that kind of themes. Translations, um, yes, you could create your own uh, nil language, for instance, and then <laughs> replace all, all the patches, uh, every every occurrence of the of the word patch with uh, something else. But yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. That's crazy. Uh, no, I was just hoping that the word, that particular word choice could go away in some way on, uh, for, for uni, because it outside of Sousa corporate and, and direct customers, that's not a term that's used for package updates like ever. And so I know where the heritage comes from. I know why it's called patches. And I know that this is just one of those weird idios idiosyncratic things that shouldn't exist, but it is. It'd just be nice if it didn't have to be propagated into a uni to confuse everyone else. <laughs> yeah, well, um, themes are a different thing. So those, yeah, you could create your own translation if you want, but the discussing the default term in English is a different discussion we use the term that SUSE uses. And when SUSE changes the term, the official term for patches, then we will also change it. But so far, yeah, patches are patches, even if some people call them updates. And I have to say that coming, uh, uh, being a former SUSE, uh, former Debian developer, I was also surprised by what what is a patch because in the Debian world, there's no patches. Everything is an update. <laughs> Essentially, That's but... true in the Red Hat world and the Ubuntu world. Um, yes. Also, another thing I just wanted to point out is a comment. Uh, you cannot use pre-seed to, to automate installations of Ubuntu anymore. That's not a thing. Oh, really? They have removed that in 2004? I yeah, read that, about, that, about that, but yeah, I, they, I thought they, they still did. kept it around. Nope. The uh, Debian installer is no longer used for Ubuntu at all as of 2004. So... Uh, you're out of luck in terms of, you know, wow. automation of uh, of mass installation. Oh, wow. Then this is going to get fun because it's <laughs> press it for Debian, something else for Ubuntu, and then we have Kickstart for Rail Clones and Autodesk well, and Yobi for less. The and current recommendation for Ubuntu is to uh, take one of their cloud images and use cloud in it. Cloud in it. Yeah. Yep. Well, they invented cloud in it, so of course. Yeah, yeah, I can understand that. So the, the funny thing is that we use cloud init in Suma form, which is the tool that we use for developers and um, for QA. So maybe adding cloud init is not even that uh, stupid. It certainly would be useful as a cross distro yeah. uh, fast install thing, because I believe one of the, there is a, a similar project out there that can do bare metal installation super quickly by abusing cloud images and doing weird things in cloud in it. Mm. Well, we'll have to see. Normal installations. We'll have to, yeah. I'm showing here how you are navigating a bit of Uyuni because the presentation part took, you can see this is the formulas with forms. You can see that this, this is originally a YAML file, but Super easy to use. It renders to something that's very, or if I want to deploy Prometheus exporters, say I want to deploy Prometheus exporters, I just need to click this, go to a Prometheus exporter and say, hey, and I can even label the REST proxy if I want to deploy several 
to node exporter, Apache exporter, Postgres. I'm going to deploy here, this, and then save the formula. And then I need to apply the highest state, which I can schedule at any time. Or I can even add to a new action chain to perform this together with other stuff, and it will just happen. That's it. And it's we're at the top of the hour. Thank you very much for attending. If you're interested, join our Uni Community Hours uh, Friday in two weeks, so 4 p.m. Uh, European time. There's more information in the Uni Announce, Uni Devel, and the Uni Users mailing list. If you want to translate to Uni, join the Uni Translation Translation a mailing list. We are also available on Gitter, and yeah, um, you can also find me on my email. Thank you.